Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and today I'm at the annual Game Developers Conference, GDC in San Francisco. And I think it's gonna be an interesting one because this is the first GDC since the launch of both the MetaQuest 3 and the Apple Vision Pro. Both headsets that emphasize mixed reality, hand tracking, room mapping, and new features that game developers now can tap into. And so we're gonna get a couple demos, we're gonna chat with some developers, see how they're thinking about using these new features and what the future crop of mixed reality games could look like. Let's head inside. I first met up with developer Thomas Van Bowel, creator of the popular VR puzzle game, Cubism, and the upcoming mixed reality game, Laser Dance. So uh, Cubism is a simple puzzle game about putting blocks into shapes. So it's super easy to pick up, but it gets very hard the further you go as the puzzles become more hard, uh, harder. Um, it started as a VR game, uh, but then as the Quest 2 in through software updates got a lot of new uh, capabilities like hand tracking and pass through, Cubism sort of evolved with it. Um, and I now primarily really see it as a mixed reality game. And um, since one of my main goals with the game was to make it as easy and accessible as possible, like a great introduction for people who never played VR or who maybe never played games. Um, mixed reality and hand tracking are a really exciting step to make that barrier a bit lower. It doesn't necessarily make the game easier, but the, there's still a barrier for some people to put on a headset and stay in there for a long time. And mixed reality just uh, lowers that barrier a bit because they don't get disconnected with their environments or the people around them. Right. Uh, and especially for someone, uh, like I've demoed Cubism a bunch of times uh, during development and after as well. Um, I've seen it be a lot easier with mixed reality actually, because putting on a headset to someone, them seeing you and then you explaining the game and helping them where they need it, uh, it's just so much easier uh, in mixed reality and so much more natural. And that's still, for a lot of people, their first experience in the medium is somebody showing them, right? Yeah. So trying to make a game that's easy to show to someone uh, has been easier with this technology uh, improvement. So. It's a game that feels so intuitive to, to learn, a puzzle game fitting shapes into 3D shapes, but takes advantage of what VR and mixed reality has to offer in terms of the spatial understanding of those shapes. Yes. So you're encouraging players to, to look around and manipulate you know, the shapes themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I feel like having the mixed reality aspect to it makes that spatial aspect feel even more powerful. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm still hoping to be able to uh, keep improving it as it goes on. I think um, Quest 3 introduced a lot of elements that uh, make it more comfortable and more interesting in mixed reality, just color pass through by default. Uh, but also a scene understanding, uh, which is a minor component in Cubism. You can actually mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, um, mark off your table and then place the puzzle on the table, for example. But one key component that's still missing is persistence, right? Like, uh, to a certain extent, for me, the final form of Cubism in mixed reality is it being sort of like a Rubik's cube that sits on your desk next to your work, where you can like pick it up quickly, do a puzzle, and take a break from your work and then get back to work. Um, and for that, you want sort of to leave the puzzle where it is yes. uh, when you're done and then come back to it. Uh, a kind of multitasking way for full spatial computing. We'll Absolutely, call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why yeah. not? <laughs> yeah. uh, and hand tracking, something you also implemented. Yes. Um, it works great with controllers. I, I'm curious because I actually prefer playing with controllers. Mm -hmm. I like being able to manipulate with the pinpoint accuracy Absolutely. and also using a mixed modal, using my thumbs to, mm. to rotate the pieces as well. For sure, yeah. What's been your feedback? How do you think about hand tracking versus mm -hmm. controllers for a game like Cubism? Yeah, absolutely. On uh, Quest 3, actually I, I have like uh, very accurate statistics on how many people actually use hand tracking. It's about like one in five, a bit over that. Um, and so it's true, like with controllers you will always have more accuracy and have a little bit more control over placing uh, pieces, which uh, helps here. But I think for me personally, the barrier is a little, a little smaller yeah. to just like pick up and play something with hand tracking. Actually, as a developer myself, I used to, at the start of hand tracking, still like pick up controllers to test the game if I had to like QA a new release or something like this. These days, I actually just do it with hand tracking because it's, for me, it's easier and there's less steps um, mm -hmm. to sort of go through the game. And so for some people, that is also the case. It seems that they feel it's uh, more comfortable to pick up and uh, do like short games with, uh, with just hand tracking. But experiences vary, of course. For some people, controllers will always be more uh, more comfortable. Well, I For, love that you're supporting both. Yeah, absolutely. You support yeah. both, and you let you know, maybe advanced users who, you know, are, are very familiar with controllers and want that precision and yeah, immediate yeah. responsiveness to take advantage of that. Absolutely. Um, and for, for a lot of people, uh, it's a slow game in a sense, like you're yeah. doing a lot of thinking and not necessarily a lot of moving. So for a lot of people that also helps, like you're only rarely putting a piece or uh, moving mm. things around if you're really like stuck in a puzzle. So that slowness of the game sort of also works pretty well with the head tracking for a lot of users. So. Is there any idea of maybe uh, 
introducing more complex gestures. Right now, mm -hmm. it's very intuitive. You're you know kind of pinching and grabbing, physically manipulating. Mm -hmm. But where do you see, do you see hand tracking? able to abstract different movements or yeah. use uh, it more like a controller, I guess? Right, yeah. Well, I think you lose a bit of the magic of hand tracking there. Mm. Um, like the difficulty that a lot of people who don't play games uh, have with controllers is that they have to learn this abstraction of interaction, right? Yeah. For us who, who do have like a history of playing games, you pick up a controller, even something like a, a Quest controller, which is very different from like, an Xbox controller, and still understand what the joystick is, what a trigger is. We pick up very quickly the abstraction to do interactions. The benefit of hand tracking, uh, I think, is being able to not have to learn any abstractions. Right. Um, you can just grab a thing by grabbing it. You can push a button by pushing it. You can introduce abstractions. You know, actually, the whole interaction system for Quest is like pinching uh, with the system. It's a thing that you have to teach and learn. So it becomes a barrier to uh, to actually interacting with uh, the platform. So that's mm -hmm. something I didn't want really in uh, Cubism. Uh, there are some like um, some power user uh, gestures, so you can actually look at a piece and then go like this and sort of call the piece to you. Right, yes, so yes. You know, to make sure that everything's sort of in reach always. Um, and also because people uh, learn to pinch in the system menu. From Playtest, I saw some people launch the game and try to pinch the first button. So you can actually do this. If you hover over a button and pinch, it will also accept it, even though it's sort of designed for uh, pushing. So again, like supporting different ways of uh, doing inputs, yeah. uh, there helps a lot. So. And I'm sure from a user experience design standpoint, you have to find ways to introduce those mm -hmm. and, and, and introduce gestures and more, more complicated ways. Exactly. Yeah. Well, those are uh, partially there to, to be discovered, at least those uh, the calling gestures. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for pushing, because it's more natural, people pick it up right. uh, mm -hmm. more clearly. Mm -hmm. But also the game in uh, on Quest starts with this model to say like, hey, you should have your lights on mm -hmm. and you like grab things with your index in your thumb. The first button to accept that model is saying push to start. Yes. There was actually something that changed through playtesting where explicitly saying push just uh, like primes people to, ah, oh, yeah, you push buttons in this game, and then they know to do that for the rest of the game. So you teach that sort of uh, in a hidden way, uh, people will pick it up. It's amazing that this many years into VR, you still have to tell people treat it like it's a real thing. Right. Right. <laughs> like, like, we're Which still... is only a problem if they learn to not treat it like a That's real thing right. in the system. So yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting um, debate, I think. Like, mm -hmm. do you use abstractions where they're maybe a bit more versatile, or do you use things that are less precise but more natural and easier to pick up? It's, uh, it's interesting. I think. You, and you mentioned both. you're now taking advantage of some of the, the more scene understanding or the more, the, the more Mm -hmm. uh, the spatial understanding of the room yeah. that the Quest 3 allows. And that's something that you're really tapping into with laser dance. Yes. So tell me about that. Absolutely. So um, uh, laser dance is, uh, in contrast to cubism, is built from the ground up as a mixed reality game. The whole reason I'm, uh, I started building mixed uh, laser dance is that I wanted to try to figure out a sort of game that could only work in mixed reality. Um, very quickly, like laser dance, the idea is that you turn any room of your house into a laser obstacle course. You place uh, two virtual buttons on opposite walls. And then you go back and forth, pressing a button. And every time you press the button, a new pattern of lasers uh, will sort of spawn in your room, where you have to move your whole, whole body around it. Yeah. Um, the patterns are sort of adaptive. Uh, so they try to adapt to the room that you're in. Um, and uh, yeah, you really play with your whole body. Um, the, uh, the game is currently working with uh, upper body tracking, um, inside out body tracking in Quest 3. So it'll actually know where your, your sort of upper body is, and where your spine is, and where mm -hmm. your head is. And so you really have to sort of move with your entire body. It's a very physical game. It's very fun to watch people play because they look super silly. Yes. Uh, sort of dancing around their room. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's really from the ground up made from mixed reality. And that was sort of my whole goal with it. Like um, for any VR game, you can sort of ask like, does it need to be in VR or not? And the answer might be no, and it's still a really fun game. It's just more immersive. But when the answer is yes, there's usually something special about it, right? Like a Beat Saber built all around like your motion that's enabled by the, the headset. That's something really interesting. And I think for the same, uh, for mixed reality, you can ask the same question. Like, does a VR game need to be in mixed reality? The answer might be no, like in Cubism, but it still adds a lot because it adds to that immersion and it makes it more accessible. But I was trying to figure out what's a game where the answer is yes. Has, and hopefully yes. Laserdance uh, is, is an example. Of that. And it really takes advantage of the tools now you're given. Now, the way yeah. I understand it, in the Quest 3 allows you to tap into what the user has designed as a mesh you know, generated by the yeah. cameras, right? Mm -hmm. The user will look around and you get this geometry that's built out, or they can customize and say, you know, design my chair is here, my yes. sofa is here, my walls are here. Mm -hmm. How does your system tap into either of those, right. see, the seat understanding of what the room is? So it actually works with both. Uh, the game was first designed around the initial uh, system of, uh, you know, drawing boxes around your furniture mm -hmm. and manually setting up the room. But that's a system that's also very error-prone uh, on the user side. Mm. Maybe you missed a, a key piece of furniture, 
maybe you didn't like uh, set up the walls correctly, and that can result into faulty gameplay or a gameplay where you can't fully progress to the level uh, because the game is asking you to like move through a piece of furniture or a wall you can mark, right? And so mesh, hopefully in the long run, will become a more sustainable and easier to set up and a more versatile way of like um, setting up your room like this. Mm -hmm. um, so having the mesh, for example, my, my apartment in Brussels where I live, uh, is under a roof, so I have these like slanted ceilings. Yes. And so that's something that you would never be able to capture with the old system. Right. Right. That always abstract everything into a box. Cubes, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, rectangles, exactly. Yeah. And also the walls are always like a straight up uh, a prism, let's Perpendicular, say. Perpendicular, yes. Exactly, so now I can actually capture that with the mesh and try to uh, anticipate that with mm. how I spawn the laser patterns. Mm. Uh, and so it becomes a lot more natural and much more resilient to different types of things, I guess. And but the game supports both for this one. And the game you're designing, because you're generating these two endpoints and lasers or just these raycast, you know, beams, yeah. it doesn't matter if that mesh, it can be a little noisy, it can be uneven, yeah, yeah. but it still works for the game. As long as the, the mesh uh, is detailed enough in the places that matter, yeah. uh, that is like, that'll work. That's actually a challenge I have right now, like, just the mesh API uh, and sort of working around, making the game around mesh is very new at this point. Uh, so there's still a lot of back and forth between uh, you know, developers working with this and platforms as well mm -hmm. to what is needed. One of the issues right now is that actually uh, the mesh where you walked is, can be very high detailed. Yeah. But part of the mesh that's generated on uh, Quest 3 might not be high detail, right? And oh. so you might get situations where um, maybe uh, you scan the good part of your apartments, but you miss the parts and it's sort of filled in as like a blank spot. Yeah. We only know what data we get from the mesh and sort of try to make good estimates on this. But for example, the, the game uh, has custom pathfinding. Uh, there might be like a level that's like a tunnel of lasers that you have to go through that tries to go around your furniture. But if there's an empty spot that's actually a wall, it might wow. uh, be blocking. So that's still something that needs to be figured out in like the APIs. Like, uh, how do you get the information to developers to be able to handle those cases? Yeah, because right? yeah, yeah. you, you have to maybe work with incomplete data yeah. in a variety of infinite combinations of right. spaces. <laughs> While still, you know, broadly saying, exactly, this is the minimum spec for for a room. Exactly, and the users in. still have, with the old system of manually setting up uh, furniture boxes, you have some uh, degree of control to like fix issues if they happen. Like, yeah. if your mesh capture missed the spot, you can actually just put a box mm. where a wall needs to be or mm -hmm. where a piece of furniture needs to be. Uh, so that way, you can sort of fix some of those issues currently. But down the uh, down the line, like hopefully, uh, mesh APIs and things like that will become more resilient for these sort of things and provide the right amount of data to developers to be able to handle all the edges. What's the on the extremes? What's like the largest environment or the smallest <laughs> or the most complex environments yeah. that this will work in? Um, so right now, I try to design for the lowest common denominator. The minimum requirements is uh, to have three meters as the minimum distance between the the buttons, so about ten feet, I think. Um, it doesn't have to be the direct distance, just the smallest walking distance uh, that like pathfinding would find. Mm. Um, and actually, when you're setting up the buttons, the first button you place in the wall, while you're setting up the second button, you'll see a sort of meter that tells you exactly the distance yeah. and like the path it's finding yeah. in your space. Yeah. So you can directly see what, uh, what that distance is. Um, that's the minimum, and then the game will work. That's like enough to sort of spawn interesting levels in between. Um, I've tried to, I work from like a co-working space, which is like a big, open office, so I've tried to like scan part of that. That's part where like these uh, detail issues come up in uh, meshing, because like there's a, an upper limit where if you're scanning and scanning and scanning at a certain point, the quest stream will just stop. Um, what exactly that limit is, I think that still needs to be determined. But there it will have like a high detail part and it will fill in the gaps. Uh, so in the, in the office, for example, uh, it had a high detail part where it captured all the desks and all the chairs and all that stuff. Then had just a, like an empty spot <laughs> where all the desks were, but where the capture just sort of stopped. Yeah. So that sort of uh, those cases still need to be handled uh, through improvements. Uh, with those APIs. Well, yeah. the smart, and brilliant thing you've done is that you've designed a game where you want the player to work with the system because they're they're only going to get the best experience yeah. when they try not to break the system. Right, when they exactly. when they give you as much information, yeah, when yeah. they play in the most kind of fun and optimal space. Exactly. Because you're working together with the player to create a fun experience. If they try to break it, they're yes. not gonna have fun. <laughs> and the best place really is your living room yeah. or like your bedroom or like any space in your house, which will have a, a limit to how big it is probably. Yeah. Depends on where you live, of course. Um, and like the fun thing about mixed reality is, I mean, you remember the old days of VR uh, when ACC Vive came out and people were very excited about like room scale VR. Yes. And um, maybe you remember uh, Unseen Diplomacy. Yes, uh, yes. It also had laser elements to yes. it. Yes. But you needed yes. two by three meters. Yes. And so the limiting factor was people having enough space being able to push their furniture around. One of the cool things about mixed reality is you can actually make those part of the gameplay, right? 
I uh, mentioned uh, like pathfinding that the game uses. So if you have furniture in your house, the game will just try to find a path around it and make the game safe and playable uh, in that way. And so that's fun to be able to incorporate those things uh, in gameplay itself. <laughs> One of the first uh, places I, I tested a very early prototype was uh, also a co-working space. Mm -hmm. And we tested it in a meeting room that had like a big table underneath. Mm -hmm. And so lasers would hit the table, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> people yeah. would like crawl underneath the table for like cover. So it's like fun to be able to incorporate all those elements uh, in the game. So, uh, it's, it's an exercise game disguised as <laughs> a as yoga a, game almost. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. it. I love it. And now you mentioned unseen diplomacy and all the non Euclidean geometry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there are so many ideas that you can tap into. You guys are, Absolutely. I mean, you as a single developer are right, really yeah. like, are, are going far using all these features. It's awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, it's great to see you in person, same Thomas. Here, Congratulations here. So on much. showing it here and can't wait for it to come out. That's awesome. Thanks yeah. so much for talking. Thank you, Thomas. Cheers. What struck me most during my playtest of the Laser Dance demo was how much the game benefits from the play space being my actual home. The dynamic levels, use of room mapping, real time occlusion, and sense of embodiment all help blend the gameplay with a space I already have a strong connection with. That same ethos is shared by another mixed reality game I previewed, Starship Home, the first Quest 3 exclusive announced and coming out later this year. Developer Mark Schramm gave me a demo of this cozy adventure game that, like Laser Dance, emphasizes the resonant power of playing in your own personal physical space. Other developers at GDC were showing how they were integrating mixed reality and hand tracking into existing experiences like Resolution Games, Angry Birds VR, or getting in on the ground floor of Apple Vision Pro games like Beyond Studios' mixed reality endless runner game, Runaways. And because the Quest 3 and Apple Vision Pro have different implementations of mixed reality and hand tracking, I was also curious how developers working on both platforms reconcile those differences. This led me to a conversation about hand tracking with Alchemy Labs, the makers of Job Simulator and Vacation Simulator, who ran me through their own hand tracking implementation that they built on top of Meta and Apple's technology. So we build on top of Meta's base, right? Meta, and we build on top of everyone's hand tracking base. Um, but we build our own interaction layer, right? So yeah, we originally experimented back in Vacation Simulator that you can play it right now on Quest. And that was really like, how do you take a controller and make it work, right? It was very much like substituting the one button and then mm -hmm. the teleport. Um, but this uh, and the cafe, the cafe demo, the demo that you played today, is very is much more like what happens when we design for hand tracking first, right? And a lot of the rules that we had made with controllers don't apply. So, for instance, when we were building, we used to be like only objects that are like the size of a baseball or larger, right? And now, actually, little objects are really fun because you have individual fingers that you can pick things up. So we, what our tech does is we do a lot of kind of like. Um, we just make it work is the best way to describe it. So you might not notice, but your fingers are like stretching and pulling and they're moving around. And we're doing a lot of behind the scenes work to make what your brain thinks should be happening match the action in the headset, which is a way of interacting. And it seemed like for a while we were just getting the hang of just being able to grasp and point the basic like first yeah. order style of interactions. You guys are thinking a little bit past that. Can you talk about what happens, What the how complex, I guess, you can, get hand tracking to Yeah, so once, once you have all your individual fingers, you could do these second order interactions. So you can have like a spray bottle that's, that actually sprays, or you can have a button that you click with your thumb. So you're using your hand to pick something up and then doing this kind of second gesture while it's in your hand. We do squeeze bottles. So it's like you pick it up lightly and then you squeeze it. We have an egg that you can hold and crush. And those, mm -hmm. so anytime there's like something you can do where it's beyond the grasp, grasp state, yeah. it's really fun to like, be like, oh, I got this extra thing. I'm like holding something and using my fingers to manipulate it. And your system recognizes when players achieve that first level, whether it's grabbing a cylindrical object or, yes. or whatever your, your menu of first order interactions. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, now you can then 
do more dexterous things with your thumbs or index fingers. Yeah, yeah, and it actually came from a developer making a sponge, right? Mm. He was like, oh, we should be able to squeeze and wring the sponge yeah. out. And then we were like, he posted a video in our in our Slack and we were like, what, no way, and then he did a spray bottle and then it all fell out from there. So yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it's definitely something where, you know, we're learning it. We're in the same state with hand dragging that we were when in like 2015, to kind of go back to things, 2015 with HTC Vive. When we were working on the Vive Pre, right, the controllers would like, actually we had the Pre Pre, we had like the Mr. Hats, and the controllers would just like launch off into the distance, or they used to electrocute you a little bit, or you know, they would have all sorts of crazy interactions, and we had all these systems to account for it, and what's happened is over time, we've like taken those systems out because the, the tracking's gotten better. And the same thing's gonna happen with hand tracking, right? Mm -hmm. All these things we're doing to account and kind of like make things work, as hand tracking improves, we're going to have to do less. And it's just gonna be better. Today, you're using the worst version of hand tracking you will use. Because tomorrow it's a good way to think about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, there's also multiple platforms now. You, know, you mentioned you guys are developing yeah. for, for Vision Pro as well. Yes. What Apple may provide you, I assume, is going to be slightly different than what you might get from Quest. So there's fundamentals like the, yeah. the skeleton. But you know, how, how do you think about those two? And are, are, do you have to create a baseline of the shared inputs that you're going to get from both? <laughs> We're actually very good at building. We have this layer called Alchemy VR. And so we have a number of people who are just really good at taking kind of the raw data that we get or the massage data and like turning it into a unified set. So if you're like a developer at Alchemy, you actually don't have to think about the platform differences. Mm. We have a few people who do and make it all feel the same. Our goal when anytime we bring our game somewhere is to make it feel as if we originally designed it for that platform. And so we have a lot of work that we put in to kind of do that. So you have this translation layer that helps us. The the aesthetics of the games that you're you're making, at least you know, and even the mm -hmm. demo I've seen kind of still inherit some of the philosophies, like the larger hands, the bigger dials. Yep. I assume some of those are because of original constraints we back had back in, in VR, make things easier, larger visually. Yeah. Um, at what point do those become more refined to mirror what we aesthetically see in the real world? I think you're gonna see as things progress that, that the hands are gonna start matching the hands. You're never gonna see a perfect representation of your hands except yeah. for on the vision with the cutout yeah. because uh, if you try to like match people's real hands, you get like the weird, like. Uh, Have you done like, experimentations? Oh that? yeah, yeah. It's just like weird veiny hands, and then mm. you're like, "This is terrible." Like, yeah. I, so we're, you know, Alchemy is always going to make cartoony approximations, but yeah, I think that. You know, in this particular demo, you were playing something that had to have those because those are like the features of Job Simulator, but. Um, I think as we go on, we're finding that like you can manipulate like dice, you can manipulate all sorts of little objects, mm -hmm. and therefore the hands don't have to be as like chunky. Right. The chunky hands helped communicate something, which was you really can't do fine manipulation, and we don't need that anymore. Yeah.